So welcome to my presentation about SC Linux. Um, let's start with me. Uh, I'm Filippo Bonazzi. I'm a security engineer for SUSE. I uh, work out of home from Turin in Italy. Um, and I'm part of the proactive side of the security group. We have plenty of people from the security group here. Um, well, we do many things in the security group. Um, I mostly do some code reviews, some audits, and mostly S Linux work. Um, at SUSE, we have a few more people uh, that do S Linux stuff, uh, and that would be historically Johannes. Uh, and then we have nowadays also Kathy and myself. And what we do is we maintain the ST Linux tool chain. Uh, we have a policy that we maintain in factory, and we do the general support for bugs. Like if you open a bug on on Bugzilla with ST Linux in the title, uh, we'll get it. Um, but then for ST Linux in in SUSE, we also have product specific policies. For example, Sli Micro is the first uh, first SUSE product that has an SLinux policy, and that's uh, also worked on by Zdenek and Guyane. I think we have Guyane here. And likewise for, for Alp, which is now um, the product that has uh, that will have um, SLinux, um, there is also some product-specific maintainers. Uh, and what, in fact, we are looking uh, to fill a SLinux maintainer position in the security group in the next year or so. So if you're interested, you know where to find us. All right, so after a brief introduction, what are we actually going to talk about today? Um, so since historically, as you all know, um, SD Linux hasn't featured a lot in, uh, in OpenSUSE distributions and SUSE products, for that matter. Um, I'm going to give like a general high-level introduction, more on a theoretical side, on, on what SD Linux is, how to reason about it, how to interpret it, and how to work with it more on a, more on a system level, less on a command level. And then we will look um, a little bit at how this gets declined specifically in a system like Alp or like MicroS, for that matter, where you have container runtimes and containers running as, as a slightly different system then. All right, so if you have seen any SC Linux presentations by, for example, Dan Walsh, then you know what's coming. I'm now going to give you a theoretical definition of what SC Linux is that will make you all SC Linux experts in, in one slide. So SC Linux is a labeling system. Every process has a label. Every file directory, every system object has a label. Rules control access between labeled processes and labeled objects. And the kernel enforces the rules. That's, that's it. That's, that's, all. That's, that's everything that SD Linux does. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so you don't really need to know anything else. No, just, just kidding. But uh, it really is something that helps if you think about it in, in those terms. So um, to maybe say it in a little bit more precise way, SD Linux is possibly the most used practical mandatory access control system. And it is based on the concept of a policy, right? So for example, let's, let's compare this to traditional Unix DAC um, permissions. So the thing about, the first thing that comes to mind about traditional Unix permissions is that they are distributed, right? So every file, every directory, every whatever on a system has its own permissions. So if you need to reason about more than one file, you need to check more than one file. If you need to reason about a directory tree, uh, it quickly gets uh, funny. While in, uh, in SC Linux, for example, the, the whole point of having a policy is that all of the access control information and decisions and so on, it's all centralized in the policy. So you have a central place that you can design from the start with all of the decisions that you want to allow, 
and then you can also analyze, and then you are always sure that it's always like this. The other difference to traditional Unix DAC is that access control on, on Unix with, uh, with Unix permissions is controlled by the owner, right? So you own a file, you decide who can do what on it, right? You can decide what can the owner do, what can the group do, what can everybody else do. So in principle, you are free to shoot yourself in the foot however you see fit. So you can say, set my SSH private key to public, and you can do it, then SSH will, will not work, but uh, you, you, can, you can leak information like that. While in SE Linux, well, SE Linux won't let you if you've configured it, um, because the policy has been set by the administrator, and you can't change it, right? So the administrator has thought about this, and will have thought, well, let's not allow SSH private keys, for example, to be read by the general public, so you, you, you can never do that. Another characteristic of, of SC Linux is that it's um, based on a whitelist approach, right? So by default, everything's forbidden, and you can only allow the specific things that you want and that you've thought about, and that makes sense. And you can think of it, for example, like a firewall for system calls, right? So nothing can go through except what you've specifically allowed. So let's, let's make a funny example of this. So for example, let's say that I have a dog and a cat in my house, um, and then I have cat food and, uh, and dog food, right? So how would I control this affiliation with the, with the Linux? Well, I can write these rules and I can say, well, the dog can eat the dog food and the cat can eat the cat food. And that's everything I'm going to say. And what's the effect? Well, then obviously the dog can eat the dog food and the cat can eat the cat food all right. But if the dog tries to eat the cat food, well, the kernel won't let him. Um, and also the effect of the fact that this is a whitelist means that anything else in my home or in my system, for that matter, that I wasn't specifically thinking about, anything else I have in my house, the dog and the cat still cannot, cannot access, even if I forgot. So instead of thinking about cats and dogs, let's maybe think about this a slightly more formal way. So ST Linux is a combination of existing um, Mac schemes from the, from the literature. Um, they're all well known, well studied, and go back a long way, longer than ST Linux, which is already a long way. Um, and these specific schemes that have been implemented together uh, as a practical implementation into SC Linux are type enforcement, role-based access control, and then multi-level security and multi-category security. And these are all schemes that are, have been put together to create a coherent um, system that you can use on a practical environment. Um, you can see that all of these different theoretical models apply. If you check the, the label that we were talking about at the beginning, uh, this label is also called a security context, and every, let's say, every file, every process has a label like this. What's in this label? Well, it has a system, a user, it has a, a user and a role at the beginning, the first two fields that you can see, and those belong to the role-based access control model. Then it has a type, and that belongs to the type enforcement model. And then it has a sensitivity and a category at the end. And those belong respectively to the uh, MLS and MCS mechanisms. Out of these three, four, depending how you count, um, the most important one, and this, the one that really defines how you work with the C Linux, is type enforcement. How does, how does type enforcement work concretely? Well, it restricts the system calls, or let's, let's call them actions, right? What can you do on a system? It restricts these actions based on the involved parties 
and the policy. So who is trying to do something? You have to identify them, and you can do this by checking their security context. So you can check, for example, the type of the process that is trying to do something. That's also called a domain. And then you can check the type of the system resource that it's trying to access, right? So you have identified the, the two parties. And then you can say, well, can, can they do that? Check the policy, and is there a rule that allows this process to do this? Um, so how do these rules actually look in practice? This is what the an allow rule looks like. Um, and this is the instrument that you use to say a process can do something to something. Um, so you can allow here a domain, right? A domain is the type of the process. You can allow a domain to perform something that is defined by a list of permissions, say read, execute, write, whatever, on a class, which is like a file, a folder, a socket, whatever. And so the, the process can perform some actions on some class that has a given type, right? For example, in this example here, we can see that we are allowing the initRC domain to read and execute, among others, a file that is labeled as PostgreSQL XXT. So this is what this would look like. And so now, for example, when our init system tries to start our database, it will go find our database executable, and it will try to execute it. And since we have this rule, um, the init can, can actually execute and start the database. But there is something more that is uh, fundamental, really, um, and is the, the concept of type transition. So we have just seen that, for example, the init system, in, in this example we've seen, will start, let's say, a database, right? But the init system has a, has a type, or rather a domain, that is initRCT, right? And as you will know, under in, in Unix and Linux and so on, the process tree is hierarchical, right? So the um, database process will inherit stuff if we do nothing else from the parent, right? So if we only had this allow rule here, then our database project uh, process would be launched because we have the permission. But then we would be in the funny situation where we have a database process running as initRCT. So it would have all of the permissions that initRCT can have, which are probably quite broad, and not necessarily <laughs> those that you would want a database to have. How do we fix that? Well, we need to introduce the concept of a type transition, right? So there is another rule that looks something like this, where you can say, when a domain executes something of a given class, actually, you know, it executes a file, right, of a given type, the resulting process, in this case, will have a resulting type. So to go back to our example, we can say, um, to, to fix our um, database example, we can say, well, we need to say that the initRC domain, when it executes a file of type Postgres, uh, PostgreSQL XXT, the resulting process will have the type PostgreSQLT. And this way, we have managed to confine the initRC domain to only do init stuff, and then to confine the database to only do database stuff, and we have defined a transition path across the two. All right, so we haven't looked at um, that many concepts, but let's, let's try to put them all together. So let's say um, I have a very useful app that you can see here that just reads the configuration file and echoes it to, the, to a log file. Um, how, how would we confine this uh, with a Linux in principle? I say in principle because obviously, well, this is a 
toy example, and also I'm going to go at it as a very, in a very simplified manner. Some would say that it's simplified to the point of being wrong, but let's, let's, let's look at it. So what do we have in our app? We have our executable, we have the log file, and we have the configuration file. So first of all, if we want to confine this with type enforcement, as we do, uh, we should define some types. So first of all, let's define a domain for our app when it will be on, um, in execution as a process. And then we also need a domain for the executable, uh, a type for the executable file when it sits on the disk, right? And that will be my app XXT, right? Then we need a type for our configuration file, and that will be my app conf t, for example, and then also a type for our log file. After we have defined the parties, let's define the rules. So, for example, we obviously want to allow our application to read the config file, since that's what it wants to do. And we also want to allow it to write to the log file, uh, which also supposedly will need to be created and, and so on. So is that all? Well, no. We still need to do one more thing. Um, we still need to allow the type transition from whoever will be starting our application to our actual application domain. Now, th since this is a command line application, let's say that this is started by some user, uh, which will have, let's say, user t. And so in this case, we can say, well, we need to allow the type transition from user t to my app t when we execute our executable file. And then, of course, we also need to allow um, the user t to actually execute uh, the executable file. So that's obviously very simple. Um, you wouldn't write a policy or a policy module like that, really, of course. Um, there, are, there is so much more stuff that you need to take care of, a lot more notions, a lot more things. Um, first of all, I mean, I just, I would never spell out, I don't know, 50 permissions like that on a, in, a, in a policy. I would use a macro, or there is also then a concept um, of interfaces, which is something like a function call that you can use to, to write your policy. But at the end of the day, um, if you want to confine an application uh, with an SLinux policy module for it, you will end up with three files, pretty much. And that's a type enforcement file, the TE file, which contains, broadly speaking, all of the relevant allow rules that you will have thought of. Then you will have a file context file, which will define all of the associations between all of the files that your application will interact with, say the, the executable and the log file and so on, and their respective types. And then the last thing that you will most often have when you design a policy module is this interface file, which is just a file that tells the rest of the policy and the rest of the system how to interact with your app uh, by using, uh, um, in fact, the, the interfaces that you define. Say, for example, we want to allow some, someone else in our system to interact with our log file. We would define an interface for it and so that it's ready to use. All right, so that was a general introduction to the concepts of a Linux, really. Um, so how does this carry over now from a traditional Linux system um, like, let's say, tumbleweed to a different one like, like Alp can be. So in the case of tumbleweed um, or, or any other system that has used SE Linux maybe more traditionally, you would have applications um, covered by what's called a targeted policy. So a policy that has been written by somebody that has individually targeted an application and just made it work. Um, and this targeted policy, for example, that we have nowadays in Tumbleweed is 
just to give you an order of magnitude, is quite large. It has more than 450 modules, um, and not necessarily actually all of the policy modules are shipped as part of the um, SC Linux um, policy package. There are some applications that provide their own, so you can imagine that a wide swath of, of the Linux desktop and server applications are covered by such a policy, certainly you know, all of the well-known ones. How does this change now on, on ALP like it has already, for example, on, on uh, microOS? Well, the, the primary difference here is that now the system is much smaller by, by design, and all of the interesting stuff uh, goes inside containers, right? So for the system, for the core system, everything still applies. You still have the policy that confines in and protects it just the same. But now, how do we interact with the concept of the container, right? So do we lose SC Linux? Can it do something for us? Well, it can mainly do two things, right? It can protect the system from the container runtime and containers, broadly speaking. But also, um, quite importantly, it can protect the containers from one another. Um, and now we will see how to do that. So first of all, how do you protect the system from the container? Well, the container runtime is a process like any other. Um, it has its own domain, and it's confined by a SVDNUX policy that has been designed for it. And that's contained in what's called the container SC Linux policy package, which, let's say, historically has been maintained as a separate thing than the targeted policy. But in principle, it's just another policy that confines the container runtime. And then, of course, the container runtime does everything else, right? It spawns the containers, um, which will then, of course, need to transition to more specific domains, right? We don't want containers to run under container runtime T. So how do they how do they run? Well, normal containers, if you if you do nothing about it, uh, will run under container T. And this domain uh, is a quite restrictive one. It can't do too much on your host system. It can do you know everything it, it wants to in the container, but when we talk about the host system, it has broadly generic permissions. So it can read and execute, for example, the labels that you can find under user. It can generally read, say, configuration files under ETC and so on, but not much more. And most, most importantly, it can really only write to, to this type container file T. And this is fundamental then as it allows the, the rest of the system to be protected from whatever can escape from the container, right? Because whatever the container writes on the system, where, whenever, will be container file T. So yeah, this all, it's all a big container T, right? That doesn't sound very secure. Well, if you remember when we looked at the security context for SC Linux. We briefly went over each of the fields. And the last one here is, was the multi-category security one that we glossed over. Um, but the multi-category system principle and multi-category security principle really just makes it so that you can have multiple independent versions of a type based on the category number. And you can start to imagine how this can be applied to the container scenario. So when you want to protect containers from each other in the container runtime scenario here, they all will have container T as a type, but they will be confined from each other by assigning them different um, categories, or actually, let's say, broadly speaking, different categories. But you can get it more, much more complicated than this. Say, there is, um, you know, whole field uh, that's called category dominance, where you can define 
well, what if I assign this category and this category to a container and then a different pair to another container? Can they access something in common? It's a lovely topic if you have trouble falling asleep. Uh, but the, the gist of it is really that you can confine containers from each other um, by using multi-category. Right, so you've, you've protected the system, you've protected the containers, that's, that's all. What you need to do more? Uh, what you need to do if you, if you need more? You can run what's called a super privileged container, right? Um, and that's basically unconfined. It's pretty much as bad as it sounds. So you don't <laughs> really want to do this in the general case um, because then the point of having this um, is that this will get almost the, all the permissions of the, of the container runtime, right? So this is useful in general for some maybe system maintenance tasks and so on, but it's really a lot for the general case. Um, what can you do then? Um, you can be a lot more specific than just having everything super confined or everything super open. Um, you can actually generate a custom policy for your container that allows only what the container really wants to do, um, or rather what you want the container to do, and nothing else. And you can do this by using this tool that has been developed by the containers upstream, and that's called Udica. Uh, that's a Slovak word, I'm told, that means uh, fishing rod. And you can see how it, it has to do with the adage of uh, teaching a man to fish, right? Uh, so you can generate your own policy, and you don't need to go to the policy dispenser and, and get, your, get your policy module. Um, and you can do this, in fact, in a, in a very practical way by inspecting your container description from the container runtime and just feeding it into the generator. And say, for example, that you have a container where you have a mount, right? You have mounted a file system, or you have defined, I don't know, a port bind, whatever. Um, the generator will pick that out of the container description, and it will then build a little, mo a little module that says, well, this container can access this specific directory um, for the, the, the labels under this specific mount, and it can bind to this specific port, and so on. Right, so um, we <laughs> that, that's really all I wanted to say. I should have said that I was open from que for questions from the beginning, um, but um, I'm aware that there is a lot of theory, not a lot of practical hands-on stuff. Um, so we do have some more resources if you want to look more into the technical side of it. Uh, we have a very good talk by Johannes Zegitz on just how to, how to reason about the practical stuff of, um, of ST-Linux. And also, um, there, there was just an, the ST-Linux workshop in the seminar room one upstairs. So if you missed it, you can definitely check out the recording. Um, and with that, I, yeah, I would open it to questions, uh, if there are any. Well, if there are, oh, there is one, there is one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you have this container T uh, type. Yes. Can you have a policy where you specify that this container T is supposed to transition into uh, the, some different type specific for the container that is more isolated? You have this tool now, but uh, let's, say, let's say inside you have a web browser like Nginx, and you just want to confine it to the, to the type that is uh, accessing only the web documents, etc., and uh, because this container T is a little bit broad in this, in this sense, right? Yeah, so I think um, in that specific case, you would probably want to probably generate a more specific module, because maybe 
you would need to actually access some stuff from the host, and maybe even write something to the host. And then you would need to actually go down in the weeds and, and, and generate a little module for it and, and, and run it. But depending on how you configure your container, it might also be that in a, maybe in a, in a simpler case, you don't really need to, like the con container T is already restrictive enough. Uh, of course, whenever you need to cross the container host boundary, that's where, that's where you need to then be specific with allowing stuff through. Uh, I guess uh, just a quick follow up. Um, in AppArmor, there is the notion of nested uh, policies. In SE Linux, because it's based on labels, I guess there is no nesting anything. It's just a flat kind of definition, and the nesting has to happen through those uh, definition files, right? Huh. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not um, super familiar with AppArmor at all, um, but I. I don't see what 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 would you nest in this situation? If you can maybe clarify. In in App Armor, uh, which is based on paths and not so much uh, like SE yeah, 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 so, so yeah. this is based on paths. So so in a container, the path is nested inside of a different path, right? So this is where the nesting comes in. So oh yeah 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 no yeah I I got it, yeah no the, the concept doesn't apply on SE Linux because as you correctly noted, um, well SE Linux is based on file system uh, file extended attributes. So each file is targeted individually. So you don't really have a notion of of nesting or whatever. You just say you will label uh, label each individual file. And then once it's labeled, the policy applies and, and covers all possible cases ever. Any other questions? Well, if not, then I'll leave the floor to the next speaker and thank you all for listening. <laughs>